This video is brought to you by my friends at Patreon, without whom continuing this channel would be impossible. And also by Twitter slash X handle SingularityG3, whose gorgeous art has enlivened the story from the start. Hello, fellow seekers. For those just joining our voyage, this is a trip through the nearest few hundred stars to Earth, following a rather idiosyncratic map. For anyone confused about the direction of travel or the terminology I'm using, I recommend starting at the beginning. Link up there. When I last left off, we were in orbit of the aging star Delta Pavonis, and about halfway through the six parsec ring. Just east and three parsecs north of Delta Pavonis, we arrive at 2M1540, a dim red dwarf about three quarters the size of Proxima Centauri. Only discovered in 2014, 2M1540 is believed to be older than 600 million years, based on its spectrographic signature. Rimward and one parsec south of that, we find Wise1639, a brown dwarf at the very top of Y-class, the dimmest stellar classification, meaning that if it were any smaller, it would be a planet. While the state of knowledge on this object is poor, its motion suggests it is quite old. East and five parsecs south of that, we find only the third F-type star we've visited on this trip so far, Zeta Tucani. Yes, there is a Tucan constellation. F-type stars, like Procyon, are the rung above our sun in the stellar mass ladder, typically 20-40% to 40 more massive and 500-1500 to 1500 K hotter. Rather than the homey yellow of our star, F-types are usually yellowish-white, or, if you believe this map, pus-colored. F-types are believed to remain stable for just 2-4 to four billion years, compared with 10 billion years for our sun making them unlikely candidates for life beyond bacteria. While Zeta Tuk is very similar to our sun, with most estimates topping out at 1.04 solar radius, 99% of solar mass, and just a quarter more luminous, it is believed to be between 2 and 3 billion years old, and thus approaching the end of its stellar life. That, and its somewhat low metallicity, make it an unlikely abode for planets though planets have been found around F-type stars. Zeta Tuk possesses an infrared excess, suggesting it has a debris disk at 2.3 AU, almost exactly where our asteroid belt is. Despite everything, Zeta Tuk is similar enough to the Sun to pique the curiosity of astrobiologists, who are monitoring it for signs of habitable planets. None have been detected so far. East and two parsecs north, we arrive at the sun-like star Beta Hydri. Like Delta Pavonis, Beta Hydri is a glimpse of how our sun will be faring in about two billion years' time. While its mass roughly equals our sun, its radius is almost double, and its luminosity more than triple, showing that it has already begun to bloat off the main sequence. Its habitable zone, if it has any habitable planets, would be at 2.2 AU almost at our asteroid belt. Surprisingly, studies of its solar activity suggest that as sun-like stars age, their activity decreases, at least until the red giant phase. In 2002, astronomers employing the radial velocity method believed they had detected a four-Jupiter mass planet in orbit around Beta Hydri at a distance of about 8 AU, or roughly the orbit of Saturn, but it has yet to be confirmed. Rimward and one parsec south, we arrive at Gliese 54, 
a pair of red dwarfs about 40 and 30 percent the mass of the sun respectively, orbiting each other roughly every 427 days. It is suspected, though not yet confirmed, that the largest of the two stars is variable. Further inward in 5 parsecs north, we arrive at LP145141, also known as Gliese 440. After von Manen's star, the closest solitary white dwarf to the Sun. In 2019, a freak microlensing event, in which 145 passed briefly in front of a more distant star, magnifying its light, allowed the Hubble telescope to measure its mass precisely at 56% that of the Sun. Its radius, though, is barely larger than Earth, granting it a surface gravity eight times Earth's. When it was alive, 145 is believed to have been a B-type star, a bright blue behemoth with over four times the sun's mass, three times its radius, and nearly 400 times its luminosity. At most, these monsters live less than 100,000 years, meaning that 145 has spent the vast majority of its 1.4 billion year lifespan as a gradually cooling stellar corpse. Studies by Gaia suggest that 145 may possess a binary companion, but it has yet to be confirmed. Rimward and seven parsecs south, we arrive at the binary system Gliese 66, also known as P. Aridini. Much like 70 Ophiuchi, Gliese 66 is a pair of orange K-type stars orbiting each other once every 475 years, at a distance of roughly 8 AU. Both stars are about three-quarters the mass of the Sun and about a third its luminosity. The habitable zone of either star would be only slightly closer than Earth, so the possibility of habitable planets cannot be excluded. However, Gliese 66 metallicities are slightly lower than the Sun, meaning that they would possess a relative paucity of construction material to form planets. It also suggests they are older than the Sun, at least 8 billion years old. Even so, in 2023, Gliese 66 was selected as a potential target for direct detection of habitable zone exoplanets. East and seven parsecs north of Gliese 66, we arrive at LHS 288. Also known as Gliese 3618, 288 is a red dwarf so small that it was thought lost for a time until it was relocated in 2003. In 1993, 288 flared so intensely that its X-ray emissions increased a hundredfold. Astrometry, never the most promising method of exoplanet detection, has tentatively suggested a 2.4 Jupiter mass planet around LHS 288 with an orbital period of seven years. But of course, it has yet to be confirmed. Rimward, west, and seven parsecs south, we arrive at L173-19, a red dwarf about a quarter the mass of the Sun. Studies by the creators of the map, no less, have shown that 173 varies in brightness on a time scale of less than a day. Searches for large planets around 173 have so far found nothing. West and 14 parsecs north, we arrive at Gliese 1154, a red dwarf slightly smaller than Proxima Centauri. A study in 2010 suggested that Gliese 1154 had a remarkably fast rotation period, at just 1.7 days, compared to 90 for Proxima. Rimward and 6 parsecs south, we arrive at Dennis J104814.6, a red dwarf which, like 174, varies in less than a day. Further rimward and 5 parsecs south, we arrive at the brown dwarf Ys J035000. 35000 is a Y1 brown dwarf, a stellar object so dim that it blurs the line with planet. Its surface temperature is believed to be just 115 Celsius cool enough to stick your hand in, for a split second anyway. Its mass is estimated to be just five Jupiter masses. Were this object found around a star, it would be a planet, no question. Models suggest it is younger than the Sun. Corward, east and six parsecs south, we arrive at two mass 11142618, an average T-type brown dwarf of about 40 Jupiter masses. East and three parsecs south, we arrive at another brown dwarf, 2 mass J0817-3001, like the other except less massive, at 15 Jupiter masses. In 2022, a detailed spectrographic search of its atmosphere 
detected hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide, water, and ammonia, making it essentially identical to an ice giant planet. Rimward and four parsecs south, we arrive at Gliese 1068, a solitary red dwarf about the size of Proxima Centauri. Rimward again, east and one parsec south, we arrive at LEHPM 3396, a very dim red dwarf verging on brown dwarf. West, Rimward, and seven parsecs north, we reach two mass 09392448, which everyone except the map seems to think is a binary. If it were a single object, 2448 would have a radius of about 13% the sun's, which doesn't fit brown dwarf structure models. However, it seems that in the 15 years since the companion was proposed, no one has found it. Farther rimward, east and four parsecs north, we arrive at Gliese 382, about which I can learn nothing. West and in line, we arrive at the far more interesting Gliese 393, a red dwarf about 40% the size of the sun. Its low metallicity, infrequent stellar activity, and slow rotation suggest it is very old, perhaps as old as 10 billion years. And despite what the map says, even the map's creators admit it has a planet, confirmed in 2021, about twice the mass of the Earth with a seven-day orbit, which would, unfortunately, grant it Venus-like temperatures. A study in 2006 also suggested the presence of a dust disk, roughly analogous to our own asteroid belt, but as far as I can tell, has not been followed up. Rimward and six parsecs south, we arrive at a landmark in astronomical history. Gliese 229. A large red dwarf of spectral class M1, Gliese 229 is about 70% the mass of the Sun, and, like many red dwarfs, a flare star. So far, so unassuming. But in 1995, a team of astronomers headed by Rebecca Oppenheimer, no relation as far as I can tell, managed to grab a revelatory snap with the Hubble telescope, a companion around Gliese 229, the first confirmed brown dwarf. Yes, I know, Tita 1 was snapped first, but it wasn't confirmed until a year later. Brown dwarfs, stars too small to ignite hydrogen fusion in their cores, have been speculated about since the 1940s, though they weren't called brown dwarfs until 1975 by SETI luminary Jill Tarter. Incidentally, Shiv Kumar, the astronomer who in the 1960s first mathematically formulated the evolution of brown dwarfs, absolutely hates that name, on the very reasonable grounds that brown dwarfs are not brown. Obviously, the discovery of an entirely new class of stellar object would be a feather in the cap of any astronomer, and for decades brown dwarfs were sought, but never found. Oppenheimer's was just another attempt, which she undertook despite the occasional heckle from those who'd already given up. In October 1994, she located a very likely prospect in orbit around Gliese 229. Astronomy is dependent on very short windows of time on telescopes, and it would be a year before the object was confirmed. It was then, when its spectrograph was taken, and Oppenheimer's astonished colleague proclaimed, There's f***ing methane in that thing! That she knew she'd found something special. Stars do not have methane in their atmospheres. Their searing surfaces would tear it into its component atoms. Whatever this was had to have a surface temperature of just 1,000 kelvins less than half the lowest predicted for a star. Later studies would find other volatile substances in its atmosphere, such as cesium and even water. They estimated that its radius was barely larger than Jupiter, and its mass just 50 times more, though more modern estimates have fixed it at 60 Jupiter masses, which makes it, in modern terms, a fairly archetypal brown dwarf. Gliese 229b orbits its primary at a distance of 29 AU, or the closest Pluto gets to our Sun, with a period of about 217 years. Recent studies have suggested it may in fact be a binary of its own, in which case it would be even dimmer than its discoverers believed. And Gliese 229's court keeps expanding. 
In 2014 and 2020, two planets, each about half the mass of Neptune, were found to orbit it. The first has an orbit of 122 days, placing it smack dab in the middle of 229's habitable zone. The second has an orbit of 526 days, which, so far from its feeble star, would grant it Martian surface conditions, unless its greenhouse effect were 11 times stronger than Earth's. Rimward and 5 parsecs south, we arrive at Cwise P J040235, a brown dwarf of exceptional coldness. Its surface temperature is just 93 degrees Celsius, a temperature some more insanely inclined people have bathed in. To be that cold, it must be old, though precisely how old, I do not know. West and 9 parsecs north, we arrive at the triple red dwarf system, Gliese 3522. The system comprises a tight binary that completes one orbit every 7.6 days, and a smaller companion, which orbits the pair every 5.7 years. The largest is about a quarter the mass and radius of the Sun. Like many red dwarfs, it has erupted in X-ray flares. Rimward, West and two parsecs south, we arrive at YZ Canis Minoris, a red dwarf about a third the mass and radius of the Sun. At spectral class 5, it is a nondescript red dwarf, neither too hot nor too cold. One thing it is, is a flare star, and a well-studied one. Its activity has been the focus of scientific attention since at least the 1970s. In 2009, a so-called megaflare was observed erupting from YZ's surface that increased the star's brightness a millionfold and persisted for seven hours. Another superflare, lasting five hours, was observed in 2023. Flares are caused by magnetic activity, as are star spots, and those have been observed at YZ's pole. Coreward and nine parsecs south, we arrive at the brown dwarf 2 mass J0252758 1. Only discovered in 2011, J05 is on the cusp, if you will, between the brighter L class and the dimmer T class of brown dwarfs, when the fabled methane starts to appear in their atmospheres. As such, it is seen as a prime target to learn how that transition occurs. West and 8 parsecs north, we arrive at UGPS J072227 a young brown dwarf, estimated to be less than a billion years old, of uncertain yet puzzling size. Estimates for its mass are as low as 11 Jupiter masses, which would place it below the 13 Jupiter mass limit for brown dwarfhood. Whether that qualifies it as a sub-brown dwarf or a rogue planet is unknown, and likely will never be known, at least until we send a spaceship there. Farther rumored, west and in line, we arrive at the red dwarf binary Ross 614. The smaller of the two, B, is a red dwarf about the mass of Proxima Centauri, and orbits the larger, A, a flare star about twice its mass, about once every 17 years. Three parsecs north, we arrive at yet another flary red dwarf binary, EI Cancery. Both stars in this system are smaller than Proxima Centauri, and of spectral class M8, one rung from the bottom of the stellar ladder. The pair orbit each other every 360 years. The two stars are nearly identical, except that one is nearly ten times brighter than the other. Like most stars of their type, EI Cancery habitually flares. The first study to track flares on their surfaces in 1985 detected 24 within four and a half hours. Six parsecs south, we arrive at the T-class brown dwarf, 2 mass J0415954 slash 0935066. At around 31 Jupiter masses, and with a surface temperature of 750 kelvins, 415 is so archetypal that it is often used as a standard to compare new discoveries of its type. East and 1 parsec south, we arrive at Gliese 3323, a red dwarf about a fifth the size of the Sun, but only about 0.4% its luminosity. In 2014, two planets, each about twice the mass of the Earth, were found in orbit around 3323. Some have claimed the inner planet is in the star's habitable zone, 
But if Indiana University's planet temperature calculator is to be believed, this is wishful thinking, as there is no way to get its surface temperature below the boiling point of water. The outer planet is decidedly frigid, but could be made habitable with a greenhouse effect eight times stronger than ours. Rimward of 3323, we arrive at what appears to be a red dwarf binary, but is in fact two single stars separated by three parsecs. The first, LHS 2090, is a dim red dwarf about a tenth the size of the Sun. The second, Gliese 3379, a red dwarf about a quarter of the mass and radius of the Sun, is classed as a flare star. It has a very active surface and a strikingly fast rotation of less than two days. About 150,000 years ago, it was the closest star to the Sun, at roughly a parsec distant. One parsec south, we arrive at Gliese 205, a red dwarf a bit more than half the mass and radius of the Sun. In 2019, two planets were believed detected around Gliese 205, one of which would be in the star's habitable zone, but neither have been confirmed. Many parsecs west and one parsec north, we arrive at Ross 47, a red dwarf about a quarter the mass and radius of the Sun. Three parsecs north of that, we arrive at the brown dwarf, or is it, Wise A J082507. J082507 is a Y-class brown dwarf, and like other Y-class dwarfs, blurs the line between star and planet. In fact, 825 pushes the definition of planet to breaking point. Its mass is estimated to be less than eight times that of Jupiter, which would make it a planet if it were in orbit around another star. Coreward and one parsec north, we arrive at another brown dwarf, 2 mass I, J0937347, a T-type brown dwarf with a peculiar spectrum that suggests that it either possesses a very low metallicity, which would make it very old, or a very high surface gravity, which would make it either very big or very dense. This can be seen in the fact that its mass is listed as anything between 25 and 41 Jupiter masses. West and four parsecs north, we arrive at the red dwarf binary, Gliese 1138 about which I can learn nothing. Rimward and seven parsecs south, we arrive at Wolf 294. Also known as Gliese 251, Wolf 294 is a red dwarf about a third the mass and radius of the Sun. In 2019, two planets were believed detected around Wolf 294, though only one was confirmed, a super-Earth of about four Earth masses orbiting its star every 14 days. Some have claimed this orbit places the planet in the star's habitable zone, though according to the calculator there is no way to get the surface temperature below 190 Celsius. Rimward and one parsec north, we arrive at QY Auragai, aka Gliese 268, a binary of two small red dwarfs, each about a fifth the mass of the Sun, orbiting each other in about 10 days. This arrangement makes the system an RS Canum Venaticorum variable, Gotta love those science terms. An RS etc. variable is a binary system whose components orbit so closely that their magnetospheres interact, each generating star spots on the other's surface. Needless to say, it flares. Four parsecs south, we arrive at Wise J041022, another brown dwarf of striking diminutivity, blurring the line between star and planet. Some estimates place it at a comfortably brown dwarfish 20 Jupiter masses, but it might be as low as 8. It was one of the first Y-class brown dwarfs ever discovered, and at the time, one of the faintest stellar objects ever observed. Following the line and three parsecs south, we arrive at C.D. Seti, an almost alarmingly average red dwarf. The only thing notable about it is that it is relatively calm for its type possibly suggesting it is quite old, and also the planet found to orbit it in 2020, a super-Earth of about four Earth masses orbiting its star in a little over two days. Its solar flux is about nine times what Earth gets, meaning it likely possesses a Venus-like climate. Coreward and in line, we arrive at the brown dwarf J025409, yet another brown dwarf that, at just 10 Jupiter masses, strains the definition of planet. You know, you might think this would be worth sorting out. 
West and nine parsecs north, we arrive at the livelier system, Gliese 338, a binary system of two red dwarfs, each about two-thirds the mass of the Sun, orbiting each other once every 975 years. Both stars are relatively inactive. In 2020, an ice giant-sized planet of about 11 Earth masses was found to orbit the smaller of the two stars once every 24 days. Again, making it like Venus. Seemingly right next to 338, but actually nine parsecs south of it, is the triple star system Gliese 105, an orange K-type star, about 70% the mass of the Sun, orbited by two red dwarfs, one at a distance of 24 AU, the other at a whopping 1200 AU. The outer star, with the very 80s-sounding name of BX Seti, is a B-Y Draconis variable. Its surface is so covered in star spots that they can be seen from across space. Because it shares proper motion with Gliese 105, it is believed to be gravitationally bound to it, though its orbit is obviously difficult to ascertain. The inner star, C, is one of the faintest red dwarfs known, only about 8% the mass of the Sun, substantially smaller even than Proxima Centauri. Coreward, west and 10 parsecs north, we arrive at Wise 1055 plus 5443, a Y-class brown dwarf with an atmosphere more akin to a giant planet, including volatiles like methane and ammonia. And yet again, it is just four to six Jupiter masses. Astronomers have found it difficult to place its spectrum in any one star type, perhaps because it isn't a star. Rimward, west and five parsecs south, we come to Stein 2051, a binary comprising a red dwarf about a quarter the mass of the Sun, orbiting a white dwarf about two-thirds the mass of the Sun, but only a quarter larger than Earth. This mass was confirmed in spectacular fashion in 2017, when it bent the light of a background star, additionally providing more evidence for relativity, the first time this had ever been achieved for a star other than the Sun. As for the man it's named for, Johann Stein, he was a perfectly decent individual. Born in the Netherlands in 1871, he was orphaned before the age of 18, but, thanks to the generosity of friends, was able to take holy orders as a Jesuit. At the University of Leiden, he studied maths and science under Hendrik Lorentz, and eventually joined the Vatican Observatory for four years, where he studied eclipsing binary. He would later assume directorship of the observatory and sought to modernize it, including moving it out of Rome in 1933 to the more astronomically favorable Castel Gondolfo. At 78, Stein retired from observing and took up astronomical history. A man after my own heart. Further west and five parsecs south, we come to 107 Piscium, an orange K-type star, about 80% the mass and radius of the Sun, but just half its luminosity. Its relatively slow rotation, at 35 days, Low metallicity and sun-like surface activity suggests it is older than the sun, at perhaps six billion years. As you can imagine, several attempts have been made to locate a substellar companion to 107 Piscium, planetary or otherwise, but none have been confirmed as of yet. Eleven parsecs north, we arrive at the red dwarf and flare star Gliese 424, a.k.a. S.Z. Ursae Majoris. 424's astonishingly slow rotation period, 150 days, is comparable to that of Barnard's star, and, like Barnard's star, is an indication that it is ancient, possibly as much as 12 billion years, or as old as the Milky Way itself. In 2008, a companion star was suspected to be orbiting 424, but was not confirmed. And again, much like Barnard's star, there appear to have been reports of planets orbiting it, but are apparently just astronomical bar talk. Moving back toward the second ring, we find these two brown dwarfs. The first, J115013, is a T-class brown dwarf about which I can learn nothing. The other, CFBDS J005910, is a young, less than 5 million years, cold, about 625k, smallish brown dwarf, of about 20 Jupiter masses. U turning back onto the road, we find two mass J00345 
and YJ004945, both T-class brown dwarfs about which I can learn nothing. Back on the westward trek and four parsecs north, we arrive at I cheered. And hey, look, the first star on this trip since Altair with a classical name. Except it isn't. I mean, starts with an A, nice guttural H in there. Must be Arabic, right? Maybe, but no one can tell, since it doesn't appear in literature before 1950, where it shows up in a Slovakian star atlas. No one has a clue what it means. And it isn't alone. Thirteen other stars in that atlas received novel monikers of uncertain etymology, including, but not limited to, Arich, Hasale, Hatisa, Kafa, Kasora, Sarin, and Till. So if anyone's searching for character names for their next Dungeons & Dragons campaign, there you go. Regardless, it is a binary system of a bright G-type star and a dimmer K-type star, orbiting each other every 480 years. Their average separation is 71 AU, but their orbits are so eccentric that they do occasionally come as close as 36 AU, which is Pluto's distance from the Sun. A is about 97% the mass of the Sun, about 101% its radius, and about a third more luminous. B is a typical K-type about 60% the mass and 66% the radius of the sun, and about 6% its luminosity. A's low metallicity and slow rotation suggest it is older than the sun, possibly by as much as a billion years. Despite the two stars being far enough apart to support sizable planetary systems, no planets have been detected around either star. West and six parsec south, we arrive at LSPM J0036, a hot brown dwarf with a fast rotation, just three hours, and thus a powerful magnetic field. Its spectrum includes a variable emission that may be due to the presence of an unseen companion. Polarization of light from its surface suggests a cloudy atmosphere. HD 219134, also known as Gliese 892, is one of the most remarkable stars on this journey. Superficially, it appears nothing special an orange K-type star, about 80% the mass and radius of the Sun, and about a quarter its luminosity. But its relatively slow rotation, about 40 days, belies its mediocrity. Such a rotation is a mark of extreme age, possibly 11 billion years. Yet the slow, steady churning of its K-type innards leaves no mark of age on its face. It will remain its youthful main-sequence self for at least as long as it has until now. Surprisingly, it has a relatively high metallicity, higher even than the sun, suggesting it may be home to planets. And oh boy is it! The map marks too harshly. Even NASA affirms that 892 has five planets, and many argue it has six. Not only that, but uniquely for a planetary system so close to ours, two of them transit 892's surface, meaning we can learn not only their mass, via radial velocity, but their diameters, and thus their densities and composition. Think about that for a minute. We now know as much about the planets of a system 21 light years away that we knew of those in our own system 200 years ago. There are strange echoes of our home in 892's system as well. The innermost planet, B, orbits 892 in just three days, meaning that, though it is four and a half times Earth's mass and about one and a half times its radius, it is likely an airless, scorched hell like Mercury. Models suggest it could be so ravaged by 892's solar wind that the blasting of its surface may be visible from Earth. One paper even speculates that, due to its relatively low density, relative to the next planet, it's still denser than Earth, it may be a Mustafar-style magma ocean. Regardless, a study in 2017 suggested that, astoundingly, it may still have an atmosphere. The next planet, C, fares little better, and is likely a smothered inferno like Venus. It orbits 892 in seven days, and has an equilibrium temperature, temperature if it lacked an atmosphere, of 509 Celsius, 
which actually puts our twisted sister slightly in the shade. Given its higher density and greater distance from its star, it is more likely to have an atmosphere than B, though not by much. The next planet, F, exoplanets are named in order of discovery, not distance from their star, orbits 892 in 23 days, and so, with an equilibrium temperature of 250 Celsius, is still no halcyon Avalon. With a minimum mass of 7.3 Earth masses, it likely more resembles Neptune than Earth. And if that is the case, it may possess an atmosphere thick enough to keep water liquid even at blistering temperatures. Some have argued that F is a phantom, and that its supposed orbital period is an artifact of 892's rotation, though this is still controversial. With a minimum mass 16 times that of Earth, the next planet out, D, is almost certainly a Neptune-esque ice giant, but with an equilibrium temperature of 140 C, is starting to look a bit more like home. A bit. Because we haven't seen it transit its star, we don't know how big it is, and some astronomers have argued it may be of Earth-like size, if not Earth-like mass, and thus ultra-dense. But this is unlikely. The next planet out, G, is another controversial addition, with some sources claiming it is unconfirmed. This is likely because no one can pin down its orbital period, with some saying it is 94 days, and others saying 192. Obviously, these two orbits would lead to vastly different planets, though with a minimum mass of 11 times Earth's, G would still be best assumed to be an ice giant. That said, the larger orbit would place G at the inner edge of 892's habitable zone, with an equilibrium temperature of 77 Celsius. And while it may not exactly be walkable, a moon orbiting it very well could be. The final known planet, E, sometimes H, is arguably the most boring of the bunch, a Saturn-sized planet orbiting its star every five and a half years, and, with an equilibrium temperature of minus 120 Celsius, is unlikely to be any more hospitable than our own Saturn. If this were a novel, I would end it here. But this is a travelogue, and I'm following the map. And the third ring has six stars to go. Coreward and seven parsecs south of 892, we arrive at the red dwarf Gliese 3855, an eruptive variable star about a fifth the mass of the Sun. Traveling east from there, we arrive at an apparent binary, but in fact two stars separated by a parsec north to south. The first is the white dwarf Gliese 1221. Gliese is large, at 80% the mass of the Sun, the largest solitary white dwarf on the map, and ancient, having been in its undead state for 5.7 billion years. Age may be a factor in its astoundingly slow rotation, completing one cycle of its Earth-sized equator in over a hundred years. If Earth rotated as slowly, a second of a day would last ten hours. Next to it we find, yes, another star with an ancient proper name. A real one this time. Well, not exactly. Al-Safi, a.k.a. Sigma Draconis, is, like Betelgeuse, a mistranscription. Only this time we know what the original word is, al the tripod, as the star formed part of an asterism with Upsilon and Tau Draconis. al or perhaps I should just say Sigma Draconis, since Draconis is one of those words that would sound cool if you put fish paste in front of it, is a bright, orange, K-type star, about 85% the mass of the Sun, three-quarters its radius, and about 40% its luminosity. It has very little surface activity compared to the Sun, and is believed to be about 3 billion years old. East and three parsecs south, we arrive at E.V. Lakatai, a red dwarf about a third the mass and radius of the Sun. Its brightness suggests it is young, perhaps 125 million years. E.V. Lakatai would be just another anonymous red dwarf had not, on the 25th of April 2008, NASA's SWIFT satellite caught a flare on its surface larger than any flare ever detected, thousands of times more powerful than a solar flare, and, had it been in a constellation on our side of the sun at the time, visible to the naked eye. Two parsecs south, we arrive at the red dwarf binary EQ Pegasi. The larger of the two, A, is about 40% the mass of the sun. The smaller, B, is about a third A's mass, 
and orbits A every 229 years. Both stars are flare stars. It is possible that both stars are binaries in themselves, though this has yet to be confirmed. In 2022, a planet about two and a half times the mass of Jupiter was found orbiting A every 284 days, giving it an effective temperature of minus 64 Celsius. And that, bar wise J23542, brown dwarf about which I can learn nothing, is the end of the third ring. I hope you're enjoying this pinball trip around the nearest star systems, even as the lesser known stars begin to crowd out the famous ones. Please let me know if you want me, and my artist friend, to continue our journey to the outer reaches of this map. And of course, please like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you again, fellow seekers, somewhere in space and time.